Hey, everybody, it's Greg Harrelson here. I just want to welcome everyone back to another episode of the Level Up podcast. And um, you all probably recognize the guests that I'm going to have on today. And uh, not only would you recognize him because of his own podcasting and some of the events that he puts on, um, but I've had him on the show before. I might have had him on the show more than once. I really don't know. Um, and I've been on his shows in the past. But to, today I've got Jeff Cohn, good friend, phenomenal entrepreneur out of Nebraska. I think he's based out of Omaha with Keller Williams. And uh, Jeff, thank you for uh, joining me once again. I'm excited. I know it's going to be uh, it's going to be a great conversation, man. Thank you again for being here. Greg, always a pleasure, obviously. Um, yeah. You and I are cut from the same cloth. And I remember I tell I think I told the story probably on this show a couple years ago. First time I ever saw Greg was when Frank Clezitz had just come from your office and he shot a video of his office doing prospecting from 7 a.m. to 10 a.m. every morning, I think Monday through Friday. And I said, I, you know, it's one thing for people to say that they're doing it, but Frank had a video. So I was like, let's see this thing in action. And there Greg was in that cubicle rocking the calls out. And it was just awesome to see you as the leader in the trenches with your people and everyone had great energy. The culture was awesome. And I've always had a lot of respect for you and your business. Man, I appreciate it. I, I, I really do. So, hey, I want to jump right into the meat of this because I'm really curious, man. I, I've, I've been out to see you and hang out with you. And I remember we went fishing over there in Charleston. I don't remember around a boom yeah. town conference that one time yeah. you were in, in, in the area. Um, but there's been a lot of change, man, going on. Number one, I, I that uh, thing that I've noted is you kind of went from this massive team to now like owning a brokerage. So I'm really curious. Sure. Because most people are going to talk about get away from don't own a brokerage. You know, yeah. brokerages are dying. What are you thinking, man? What brokers how, go broke? What happened? Brokers go broke. Yeah, that's right. So yeah, what, you, uh, let me download this. Nine? I'll download this quick. Um, and I think most people will identify. So really, everything that we choose to do is based on where we choose where we want to go. So a lot of people start and they're really not sure what they want to be when they grow up and they just kind of morph into different things. And there's really no goal. It's just kind of following the, the path. And I started being more intentional about knowing what my exit looked like across all of our businesses and knowing where I can create the greatest impact and influence. So we have kind of a motto within all of our organizations and it is generating more income in less time with less energy. And if the businesses that we're in aren't generating more income, less time, less energy, then people should probably go look for a different business to be in or change the way they're doing business. So most teams make the most money. And I feel like most teams are best suited for the dependent agent and interdependent agent. But where I was really struggling as I ran the number one team in the world at Berkshire Hathaway, we did 730 sides in 18, earning us number one at the brokerage across the country. What I noticed was I was having a really hard time retaining people that wanted to build big teams. And of course, all we taught, we are entrepreneurs who teach people how to run businesses. And so we had over 10 teams on our team of 26 agents. And a team is, you know, one person plus an admin or one person plus a listing agent, one person plus a buyer's assistant, whatever you want to call it, but that's a team. And so we started to discover that out of the 25 to 30 agents we had over the course of five years, we lost about 25 to 30 agents. And they were all great agents that left, stayed at Berkshire, were offered a better split structure than the company was allowing me to charge or collect off of the agent. And so there was no way for me to compete against my own broker who was um, going out and recruiting my own agents. And there was also a lot of problems in that I couldn't push my own ancillary businesses locally inside of the office. I had to house those ancillary businesses outside of the brokerage um, location, which made it a little bit more challenging for the customer that came to the office. They couldn't meet with their mortgage lender, their title person, their insurance person. And so in 2019, we announced that we'd be leaving Berkshire Hathaway to launch a Keller Williams franchise. So we own the Nebraska franchise. Um, our intention was to grow maybe at a pace of 20 to 25% a year. And in the last two years, we went from 25 agents to 150 agents. We went from 700 sides to over 2,000 sides. And we're now in nine cities across Nebraska. So that's kind of the in a nutshell, two minute version. Yeah. But the goal was I wanted to be able to attract the entrepreneur, which are what I call the independent. I wanted to be able to recruit brokerages, not individual agents that just got the real estate license. And teams are great for getting newer agents. But what happens when that agent grows up and starts to have their own sphere and they no longer feel like they need that team any longer? You can keep them for so long, but if your world isn't big enough to allow them to run an independent model inside of your world, they'll leave and create their own. And I see it time and time again with the rainmakers on mega teams. Yeah. You know, another thing of, you know, hanging out with you, you're going, you're such a great example of an entrepreneur, 
right? So if you're going to have all these agents and people around you, they're naturally going to start gravitating and want to be doing some of the things that you're doing, right? It's like, it, it, it not that you make it look easy, you probably do. And it, <laughs> we know it's not easy, but hanging around you makes it believable. Sure. And then once they believe that they can do it, then they're going to aspire to do it. So what I hear you, what out of everything you said, one of the things that I took away is that you are now in a, in a place where you can create space for other entrepreneurs to grow. You happen to own the, the brokerage, but you really created a space where other people can grow beyond. 100%. And I always have said, Greg, and I know you uh, believe in the same concept, but true leaders serve their followers by yeah. empowering them and training them and holding them accountable to becoming just like them. And it surprises me how many traditional brokers in the country and, and team leaders have such a scarcity mindset in so much that they don't want their agents to know their secrets of what they're doing. And that's what attracted me so much to your concept. You're like, here, this is exactly what I'm doing. You open it up to everyone at your team Ridge. And not only do you show them, you help them and you're there with them alongside. And so I wanted to be in a space where when there were large team leaders and or broker owners, that had yet to be invited to be part of a joint venture and mortgage title insurance investing and the list goes on and on i want to be empowered to invite them to not only partner at the brokerage level but also partner in the ancillaries that they don't know how to build on their own and so that's the reason i partnered with keller williams is because i saw there being an opportunity to expand not only across nebraska but across all 50 states so my goal wasn't only to influence and impact the local you know, city and or state that I reside in, but also to create that same influence and impact for all 50 states and hundreds, if not thousands of brokerages across the country. And just so everyone knows across all brokerage flags, it's not just Keller Williams. Yeah. Yeah. So you mentioned something about ancillaries and, and I hear more and more people talking about ancillary and a lot of them kind of gravitate towards title you know, in the beginning, if mm -hmm. they, if they have title in their state, which is most states. Mm -hmm. And then of course, a lot of them talk about mortgage and, um, and I'm assuming when you talk about ancillaries, you're probably talking a little bit beyond marketing, uh, servicing agreements. Um, hundred percent. So can I speak to it really quick? Yes, please. Yeah. So there's three ways when we talk ancillary, there's three ways where you can win monetarily. The first way and what's least valuable is a vendor relationship where someone pays you a hundred bucks a month and they're on your vendor list. You should be doing that with like landscaping companies and cement companies. And you know, the list goes on and on of all these little companies that want business from us. So how do they earn the right to be on your list? They just pay $50 a month, hundred bucks a month, something like that. That's just a vendor relationship. The second most valuable is a strategic partnership. They used to be called marketing service agreements, but RESPA no longer wants us to call them MSAs. So we're going to call them strategic partnerships. And that's where third-party companies, the most important being mortgage, title, insurance, home inspection, and home warranty, they pay a third-party company like Boomtown, Zillow, Sync for, to generate leads. And then you share access to a CRM. And then you make your money by charging your agents a referral fee when those leads they paid for come through the system. And we always charged a 50% referral fee. And in the last 10 years, we've closed 2,500 internet leads for $17 million in gross commission, of which I've kept 50% referral fees. That's a lot of numbers to unpack, but rewind and listen to that again. Those are real numbers. 2,500 closings off 100,000 leads off a million clicks off of ads that were paid for by strategic partnerships. But the most valuable way, Greg, is to own in a joint venture. And why that's most valuable is that's something you can exit and get paid for. You can't get paid for a strategic partnership or a vendor relationship because you don't own anything. But if you own your book of insurance, if you own the mortgage company, if you own the title company, it has an intrinsic value that you've created Cre uh, by all of the business that you're able to send through that entity. And it's one of the only passive ways to generate revenue. A lot of us live and die off of the next real estate transaction or point of sale. I wanted to be able to not be tied to the next transaction and be able to have a business that can exist without my team or my brokerage selling houses. I'm actually acquiring an insurance company myself, but that doesn't surprise me because you and I do think a lot alike. But what was your thought process for going into the insurance uh, business and doing a JV there? Yeah. So like I said previously, when it comes to JVs, it's one of your only passive ways of generating income. So instead of just focusing on point of sale, you can have a business that exists and runs without your own personal business doing any transactions. So what I mean by that, so let's say that I were to partner with you, Greg, in Myrtle Beach, and you had how many closings in the last 20 years? Let's call it 10,000. I don't know what your numbers would be. Yeah, it was well, almost 4,000 last year. So it's Okay, a lot. <laughs> so let's call it 50,000, 100,000, whatever, whatever it is. is. Yeah. And that's okay. just your closings. That's not how many people are in your database. Well, every one of these people has a home and auto insurance policy intact today to cover their home and autos. 
every one of them. Now, some are captive, so they're at a company like State Farm or Liberty Mutual, and some are with an independent firm that can sell 20 or 30 different products. Independent of who they're with, somebody's collecting money every year. Most people don't know how much that money is. So I'll break it down for your listeners. The typical premium in the US is around $3,000 for two autos and a home. So out of the $3,000, there's a commission paid on year one of 15%. But every year you renew, if it's captive or independent, it's a 12% commission. So just to keep the numbers easy, let's call it $500. Every year someone renews their home and auto insurance policy, there's $500. So if you had 100 people, take 500 times 100 every year. If you had 200 people, 1,000 people, 10,000 people, you guys can listen and do the math, but that's residual. That's passive income every single year, as long as the insurance company does a good job retaining their clients. So last year on 2000 sides, we had a thousand buy sides. We closed 60% of those buyers into our insurance product. So 600 buyers every year, those stay with us. We obviously will be able to collect on that. But the thing that gets me most excited isn't point of sale. It's all of the other people, all of the people from two years ago, three years ago, four years ago, you know, when they closed. So they start shopping insurance six weeks to eight weeks before their closing date, because that's their renewal date on their insurance product. And I assume you didn't sell them insurance three years ago, four years ago, five years ago. So what we're doing is <clears throat> we're partnering with brokerages that have tens of thousands of pieces of data, contact information, and they've built a relationship of trust with this list. And so if you're listening to this formula, this applies to every industry, not just in insurance. The, the goal for all of us and anyone listening is to build businesses that can upsell products of value to a list of people that you have in a database that know you like, you trust you. That could be cable, that could be security, that could be lawn services, it could be anything and everything under the sun. I like insurance because it's so simple. Mm -hmm. It's easy to quote, it takes us two minutes. It, the back office work is easy, admin can do it for $10 an hour. And it makes us 500 bucks a year, which isn't sexy by itself. But when you take 500 times 10,000, starts to get pretty sexy. And the best part of it is the exit. So people talk about multipliers in a business. It's based on EBITDA times the multiplier. EBITDA is earnings before interest, taxation, and appreciation. And so you take that times a three to five X is a normal business. Right now, insurance has a 12 X multiplier. So if you have a book of business that's bringing in a million dollars net a year on EBITDA, you could sell that today for $12 million. Mm -hmm. Last year, we brought in 450,000 and that was in our first year. And so we believe over 10 years from now, our book will be worth about $10 million in Omaha, Nebraska. And our goal is to be in hundreds of offices across the country in the next five. So pretty exciting. And we go into a joint venture. So the people we partner with, just like the deal you're probably looking at, you don't have to do any of the insurance work. You don't have to have an insurance license. You just have to give them access to your book of business and then your past book of business and you let them do their magic. Yeah, that's awesome. You know, it's just great. You know, when I first started this podcast, it was it's called the Level Up Podcast, of course. But the little side tagline is from agent to entrepreneur. <laughs> and, and, and that's, you know, you're truly a, just such a great example of somebody that went from agent, team builder, business person to just flat out entrepreneur. Hey, uh, before we get off, though, yep. you, I, I, I don't remember. This is pre-COVID. Don't remember what year it was. <laughs> but I, um, I went out, me and a, another agent in, in my office, we just, just wanted to go out and visit with you. I spoke at one of your summits. Yep. Uh, and I know you've been continuing to do those summits. A lot of people have kind of dropped off. Um, but now are plugging back in. And I know that uh, in going to events and traveling, you've got a summit coming up, I think at the beginning of June. Can you tell me a little bit about that? And, I pre yeah, I appreciate you asking. Find out about I'll it. share yeah. a story quick. So, you know, you host these events and I'm the influencer, or the person that started it, founded it, whatever. Greg came and spoke and you should have seen the circle around Greg. I was a little envious, to be honest with you. <laughs> Everybody came for you. Um, and they, they should have. You have done amazing things. You're you're a leader in our industry. But that's what this event's all about. It's about bringing top-minded individuals, entrepreneurs across several different business platforms to one place. We do it in Omaha. It's June first through the third. Greg has negotiated a discount for all of his listeners. If you put in the word podcast when you check out, you'll get a hundred dollars off, which makes the ticket two hundred ninety-seven dollars. We don't make money. It's a break-even. We only would make money if you joined our coaching company. But the focus of the event is to bring rainmakers like Greg on stage. We have real estate agents, mortgage lenders, title insurance people, um, investors. I've got Greg, um, I'm sorry, Gary Boomershine coming, who just got done writing a book. He owns realestateinvestor.com. I have the owner of Sisu coming, Brian Charlesworth. He's going to be keynoting. Josh Cunningham, the owner of Rockerbox. 
and a lot of other amazing people just like Greg Harrelson. And Greg, I want you to come back. So sure. I'd love to have you there. But just go to the teambuildingsummit.com if you want to learn more. It's just in a couple of weeks from now. So we know we're kind of late to the, the game here. But if you if the dates work, Omaha is a great place to visit in June. The weather's perfect and it's downtown five minutes from the airport. And it's in a brand new Marriott event center. So we'd love yeah. to see you guys there. Yeah. And for those that are listening, hey, look, I don't I don't just waste my time flying around the country for just any in any, any reason. Um, and I will just vouch for, uh, you know, what Jeff's got going on. And, and, and I, I know I took a bunch of notes when I was there. Yes, I was speaking. But anytime I go to speak somewhere, I'm also a listener. I, I will fall right into an audience, into the audience, take notes. And I got a lot of value out of it. So I look forward to hear, hearing the feedback. So Appreciate uh, you bringing that up, Greg. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, you're very welcome. Anything I can do to support you. Well, Jeff, you know, hey, look, thank you again for um, for for joining me on the podcast. I appreciate it. I also appreciate that we're talking about things that not everyone's talking about, like building brokerages, why you're building a brokerage, uh -oh. ancillaries, and how they should be actually, um, you know, formatted in the form of JVs. So I do appreciate you, uh, you know, joining me again, and I appreciate the friendship that we've had over the years. It's uh, I, I watch you. Maybe you you probably watch me, and and just to get current as to what's going on, I can always count on checking in with you. But thank you again. Good luck on your summit, and and tell me again. They go to what website? Yeah, the team building summit dot com or grow with ers.com. There's a bunch of other links if you go through that way. Fly in June first. We have a reception party. All day June 2nd is the event. We have a silent disco the evening of June 2nd, and then all day June 3rd, which is a Friday. And then we wrap, and most people will stick around Friday night. It's a good time Friday night, and then fly out Saturday morning, June 4th. But the teambuildingsummit.com. Fantastic, Jeff. Hey, man, you take care. Thanks again, Greg. All right, bye.